Welcome, this is Dr. Owen Anderson, and we're looking at Peter Vermigli's commentary on Genesis. This is selections from his commentary, and he's especially going to tell us today about the image of God. Now, this comes after having looked at his selection on natural theology and Romans chapter 1, and after having looked at his commentary on Aristotle. So we've done those things, and those, are, those videos are available, those lectures are available on my YouTube page. This will be the third one then on Vermigli. And what is it to have the image of God? Now I'm going to toggle between this and my notes. So we can write down things as we're going. So the image of God. Now in, in uh, Reformed theology, we might speak about the larger and narrower aspects of human nature. This larger aspect is to be uh, finite, temporal, and changing in being, wisdom, power, holiness, goodness, justice, and truth. And that's directly contrasted with the definition of God, who does not have these three. God is infinite, eternal, and unchanging but shares these. So that's where you get the, the image of God. Humans and God both have this. And then there's the narrower aspect, which is knowledge, holiness, and righteousness. Narrower aspect, not because it's a smaller definition, but because it only applies to some. Everybody has these categories, that's true, but not everyone actually has knowledge. Not everyone actually is holy or is righteous. So this is what was lost in the fall. We didn't lose this in the fall. We still had the finite ability to be good or holy or have power, wisdom, but we no longer had knowledge or holiness or righteousness. So we're going to keep these in mind. You're going to see how he, he addresses these, especially these three he talks about them in this selection. And that's in the back of our mind as we talk about, well, what is the image of God? So uh, let's go through it. I'm going to go through with you somewhat carefully. When you hear that God, and what I mean by that is we're going to read it together, not just kind of summarize or skim it. But I want to really engage with his, his phrasing. When you hear that God has formed man, do not think only of outward parts or liniments, but consider the inward parts, namely the veins, skin, sinews, the gates and channels, the bones and marrow. In short, all those means of our life that lie hidden within. I consider three chief subjects in the creation of mankind that are scribed in general and now distinguish more closely as follows. Now, instantly, this part sort of confuses me. We'll see how well he explains it. But usually the outer man means the body. The inner man is the, the mind or soul that you can't see. Whereas he just names more parts of the body that you could see if you dissect someone. If you dissect someone, you don't see their mind. That's the inner man or the invisible so let's see how he develops that, because here he's just really described two parts of the physical. So first, consultation, God consulting, let us make man. Second, God formed him from the dust. And third, he breathed in his face the breath of life. You will not read that this was done in the case of other living creatures, right? So these three things stand out. Uh, consultation. One, from the dust, and breathe life. Now, we get those things from Genesis, but I think you could, by reflection, deduce them that God would have made man uh, according to a plan, God, that, that man has a body and also a soul. 
So let's keep going here. Um, you elsewhere may find the verb of making attributed to the heavens and other things, like in Psalm 95, his hands have formed the dry land. It, and, and Isaiah 45, it is I that formed the light. And, I, and Amos 7, he formed grasshoppers. But it is not the last or least dignity of the human body that it stands upright. Thus Ovid said, while downward bend the beast and stoop toward earth, a face sublime to man he gave. So some people have noticed, noted that, that animals always look down. The Aristotelian said that, that animals always look down and humans can look up at the heavens. And that's what began uh, the process of religion or wonder. And I'm not sure. I've, I think I could have sworn I've seen dogs sitting there looking up. Um, so I'm not sure that's true. He formed him from the earth. So for this reason, the name Adam is from earth, as if it's to say born of earth. But uh, some say, however, that it was from Adam because the earth is red. So first, therefore, the instrument is formed. That's the body. And next, the motor is added, which is the soul. That's when he breathes life into him. And then by the first synecdoche, the whole is taken for the part, for the countenance and face. And here it may signify both. So first the nostrils, because by breathing they especially indicate life. And then if you take it for the face, excellent signs of the soul and of life are revealed. And some consider the metaphor is taken from the formation of glass. By blowing through certain instruments, they shape cups, bowls, and various kinds of vessels. In the same way, you'll observe a metaphor here, since God has no, has no mouth, nor does he breathe, just as he has no hands by which he might frame the human body. But in these matters, you should understand the divine power, his commandment, and present strength. So uh, God is creating, and there's an, an analogy being used where humans actually do have hands and faces, physical ones. God doesn't, but there's an analogy being used. And he says, a double expression, therefore, derives from the double meaning of the word, since it signifies both soul and breathing. I think the word in in uh, Hebrew is nephesh, right back up here. First, it says the nostrils or face of the human body were breathed into by God's command. So God, the power of God, the infinite power of God is especially revealed in this. God can, by a command, cause things to exist. No one else can do that. I mean, you could command uh, an employee to bring you something, but you couldn't simply speak world the world into existence that's infinite power power than which there's no greater and he says the uh life and the soul received and the breath was not the soul but a sort of sign that it would be planted in man from the outside and that he would should not expect uh a work of nature as in the case with other living creatures so interesting, he's making a distinction. There is the breath, but breath isn't the actual soul. I think there's something like that also in the Greek. The soul itself is not material. It's not just a piece of nature that you could get through evolution. Now he says, we read in the gospel that Christ breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Yet that breath was not the essence of the Holy Spirit, but it's symbol. So just like Christ breathed on them, that's not the Holy Spirit. Breath is not the soul. And there are some who are very just simple in their interpretation and they take it that way. So like when you die and you have your last breath, that's actually your soul getting out. So just as God doesn't actually physically breathe, so too breath is not the soul. And so it says, man was made a living soul, a living nephesh. That signifies sensible life, which other living creatures share. And so this clearly teaches us that a rational soul is given to us by God from above and has to do with all the power that the other inferior creatures possess. So the two words together in Hebrew, neshama, the rational and divine part of the soul, and nephesh. And he spoke about both of them over here also, which is the sensible part that other animals have also. 
And so you avoid what he calls a double error. We should not think of the soul as a substance of God. So it's not as if there's something called God and every soul is a little chunk off of God. Some people say that like God's a huge ember and each soul is a little spark that shoots off the ember of God. So that's an, that's an error for it's immovable and unchangeable. God doesn't change. God doesn't have parts falling off of him while the soul, our soul can change. So remember back to the larger aspect, temporal and finite, changeable. And then moreover, it is not the breath of the nature and substance of a breathing person, nor should it on the other hand be counted of the same quality and nature as that of brute animals, because nothing will, because understanding will never be found in them. So the animals don't have this. And understanding is a good word because I will have people argue with me that animals think. And they'll give examples like they're, they're feeding their dog and their dog walks up to them with their empty uh, bowl. and's like wagging around like, see, my dog knows what a bowl is and he knows what food is. But you couldn't have a discussion with your dog. You know, hey, you've been gaining some weight lately. I'm going to cut back on your food and see if he understands diet because he doesn't have an understanding. It's funny, he says, uh, this opinion uh, says, if they had been endowed with the same kind of soul, other animals might think themselves wrongfully subject to humans. So if animals had a soul like us, they shouldn't be our subjects, let alone our pets. How degrading is it to own another rational being as a pet? It's, uh, it's dehumanizing. And he says, we don't need to go any further because this, this has been uh, refuted by philosophers also. Now, there's a disagreement as to whether all human souls are created by God at the beginning. Now, I don't know if you're aware of that, but that's a debate. Did God make all the human souls? Let's say there's been 20 billion of them. Or did he make the first two or even the first one? And all the other ones are derivative of those, those first pair. Uh, are, are made, or are made by him and placed in bodies in proportion as the order of nature seems to require. So some have thought that all were created at the beginning among whom many Jews are included, and also origin. It seems that there were led to this for the reason that a rational soul is incorruptible and so is not procreated from matter. You know, the mom and the dad coming together and having a baby body doesn't explain where the new soul comes from. And therefore they say that since they are made by God from nothing, we cannot say in truth that in respect of creation, he rested the seventh day from all his work. If He's making more souls later. But this opinion does not seem likely. Since the soul is the drive and form of the body, it seems they should be produced together. Moreover, are they idle or else doing something when they pre-exist the bodily time? Like the, the gives this idea that there's all these souls just waiting for a body, and then they, they, they fall down into the body. If you say they're idle... It seems absurd that things should be left so long without their function. But if they do something, if they're not idle, it must necessarily be either good or evil. Yet scripture in Romans 9 clearly denies it concerning Jacob and Esau before either had done good or evil, before they were born. So yeah, that, that view, there's something about the human mom and dad. They come together not just as two bodies, but as two souls. And a new person comes into existence. Now, what counts more is the story of creation, which shows us that the soul was made of the very formation of the body, for no mention is made of it before, and the production of something so great would not have been kept silent. Therefore, when we read that it was inspired by him, it must be understood as made by God. The argument about ceasing from all labor is refuted when we say that God is also at work either through the continuing governance of things or else because whatever he makes is referred to the former and of the same kind as things created in the first six days. Why the body was made first before the soul is answered by the fathers. For if the soul had been introduced before the body, it might have been without a use, lacking the organ instrument of its actions. But God observed this order always to prepare first that which was taken, that which, uh, that by which things of greater value are at to act.
and a question about, yeah, that yes, those are the two views. Are the two views are he creates every soul in the beginning, or they're created through procreation, right? But God observed this order. Oh, uh, yeah. So first, the soul was uncovered from the waters. The earth was uncovered from the waters. Then the lights were made, which would exercise their power on the earth and its fruit. All the animals were made first, and the woods and plants of the earth. And last of all was made mankind to be set over all things, that as soon as created, they might have work to do. Similarly now, the body is first and then follows the soul, lest it should be idle. This divine purpose teaches us that it happens among us too, that the more people excel, the more material for working is supplied to them, lest they should live fruitlessly. Then he goes to uh, Ibn Ezra says that since man was made a living soul, he moved himself at once. The first man was not created to be weak like infants who cannot guide themselves and walk. He was more like other creatures that walk as soon as they are born. So, uh, God gives a soul and for if this spirit blows again upon the ashes of the dead, they'll easily recover their souls. That's a good, and that's interesting. Is it that they've lost their souls or their soul is dead? Those are two different things. And, and since you are your soul, you can't really lose your soul. Wherever you're at, that's where it is. It's like, it's like in one sense, you can't really be lost. Wherever you are, that's where you are. You just not, might not know where that is. That's, that's, everything else is lost. I'm right where I'm at, but the, the whole world is lost. So let us see how our, it, how our how our assertion that the blood is the soul can be true. All right, the Manichaeans cannot abide this in the Old Testament. Now it's interesting. The blood is the soul. From the blood is the life in the Old Testament, but that seems like the same thing as the breath is the life. The breath isn't actually the life. It symbolizes that. And so, too, with the blood, uh, it's not actually the life, but that's the first thing you notice if someone has a, a blunt trauma and dies, you come across their body, what do you notice? A pool of blood. So you connect up dying with the blood leaking out of you. It's more visible than the air coming out of you. So it's curious that it takes this is to be the identity is, but not the breath one. So the Manichaeans cannot abide this, and they say it's a lie, and they reject the Old Testament. They mock what is written in Genesis, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy when it says flesh and blood uh, shall not inherit the kingdom of God, and therefore blood is not the soul. Otherwise, they say Paul would exclude souls from the kingdom of heaven. Further in the gospel, Christ said, fear not, those who kill the body, they cannot touch the soul. If the blood is the soul, then surely when tyrants kill God's holy martyrs, they abuse it, they shed it, destroy it, and so on. These arguments are refuted by Augustine against Adiamantus in two respects. In the Old Testament, the sayings concerning animals, but the arguments they bring out of the Old New Testament relate to a reasonable and human soul. Therefore, their own reasoning has caught them unaware. So the Old Testament was referring to animal life. But to disprove their first argument more thoroughly, notice that when Paul speaks of the resurrection to come, he means by flesh and blood that the condition of a mortal body will be removed from the saints at the resurrection. This is what the words, that, this is what those words declare. It is sown in corruption and mortality, but it shall rise again in the opposite conditions. Consider the life of animals as well as a human soul is called blood. That must be figurative speech. Good. So he is going there. Not in the same way breath was. To be interpreted by metemony. Yeah, I get it right. Metonymy. Yep. In which the sign is put for the thing signified. And that's what Augustine said. This is my body when he gave the sign of his body. Uh-oh, that's bad news for uh, transubstantiation. And that's one of the main things. Vermigli is known for his work against transubstantiation. So not every time you say something is, is it the is of identity. So since the blood is the sign of the soul's presence, it may be called the soul itself in the scriptures, just like the breath he breathed life into him. All right, now the divine image. 
Let's see where this takes. Let's see if you're surprised where he goes. All right. The beginning of Genesis teaches us how man is the image of God, where it is written that God said, let us make man after our image and likeness that he may have dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and the beasts of the earth. This shows that the image of God consists in this, that he should be ruler over the creatures. So I'm going to toggle back now. Image of God I'm going to do this to uh, the many physical signs of the soul are not the same as the soul. So breath, blood. So to be ruler as God is ruler of everything. Now, what Augustine says is this refers to memory, mind, and will, which as faculties of the same soul represent the three persons in one substance, but the doctrine of Augustine rather shows the cause of the image of God. And, and here we go. For man is not set above other creatures to have dominion over them for any other purpose than that he was endowed with reason, which reveals itself clearly by those three faculties Augustine named. So man is only able to rule and have dominion because he was endowed with reason. Nor is it the only place the image of God is found, for it is not enough to govern and rule God's creatures well with memory, mind, and will, unless it is we understand and remember and choose the things that are pleasing to God. If our mind remains infected as it is with sin, it will not have proper dominion, but will exercise tyranny over things created. The image of God is the new man who understands the truth of God and desires its righteousness. So remember that back to the beginning, a narrower aspect, knowledge, holiness, and righteousness. So Paul has taught us when he writes to the Colossians, put on the new nature, which is being renewed in the knowledge of God after the image of its creator. Here we see that knowledge of God is true and effectual, leading to an image of perfection. So that's interesting, true and effectual. The goal of dominion. Now, um, let's see. So, so we'll come back. I haven't thought on that, but I want to see what it develops next. Um, our mind truly expresses God when it possesses the knowledge of God and is adorned with righteousness, knowledge, holiness, righteousness. For righteousness and the knowledge of divine things are nothing else than a sort of influx of the divine nature into our minds, eternal life. Perhaps you will argue that in the same way a woman, now now he's shifting subjects. So the one thing I'm noticing though in this paragraph, we need to show how knowledge, holiness, and righteousness are according to reason and their opposite is in violation of reason because he leaves it a little bit ambiguous as if you could have reason, but not get these. So you should also get these instead of showing how no, by using reason, you get those. And when you violate reason, you don't get those. Or if you don't have knowledge, holiness and righteousness is because you violated reason. Now, what about women? Perhaps you argue that in the same way, a woman is also the image of God. We say that if you compare her with, the other creatures, she is the image of God, for she has dominion over them and has use of them. But in this instance, you must compare her to man. And then she is not said to be the image of God because she does not bear rule over man, but rather obeys him. Now, we, uh, some people here just heard a sermon on 1 Corinthians 11 
And Paul in that chapter speaks this way. So at first it might sound contrary to our ears, but Paul speaks this way about man from God and woman from man. And so Augustine, he quotes Augustine though, in his 13th chapter of the book on the Trinity said, if it is understood of man and woman, insofar as they enjoy mind and reason, it is fitting they should be according to the image of God. But when the woman is compared to man as to the actions and affairs of his life, she is not the image of God because she, she was created to be the helper of man. So, so far, that's pretty much straight out of 1 Corinthians. But then he does, Augustine does this weird thing. And Vermigli notes it. He says, in the same place, he, Augustine, has another expression, although it's allegorical. And he, he, he derives from this why men don't wear hats because of the work they give is to contemplate God. I don't know what, the, like, the brim of the hat would keep you from seeing up. And women do wear hats because their, their work is on earthly things. And somehow the hat reminds them not to get too caught up in earthly things. And so he vermigli says, we don't want to rest on this. And, and I agree, that seems to be very weak. Now, the image of someone is the form of what it represents or by which it represents him. So that's Aristotle. A similitude of someone is a quality by which it resembles him. So the difference between for or, or image here and similitude, similar. We're not similar to God in one sense if we're the image of God. So what this image is, maybe put simply, not only has a person the powers of understanding through which he is not far from God, he is also made with excellent, even divine qualities, provided with justice, wisdom, mercy, temperance, and charity. Paul commends this image to accomplish our renewal to that nature created by God in holiness and truth. And he gives some quotes. But the full image of God is Christ in his divine nature. And so much as his human nature can possess of the divine likeness. And again, some quotes, Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, Romans 8. And again, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. We were made to be like that. For we have intellect and are capable of divine perfections. So we were made, yet we cannot be restored to them without the help and example of Christ, who is the primary and true image. How much we are the image of God is seen by our happiness, which we share with God. I mean, loving and knowing. So interestingly, our happiness is in loving and knowing God. Um, but if you ask by what powers we rule over things, it is not by bodily strength, for in that respect, most creatures exceed us. Therefore, it is accomplished by reason, deliberation, and art, by which we not only master and control these creatures, but also move and change great objects. This power is best restored by faith. You will tread on the adder and the serpent from Psalm 91. Daniel was thrown to the lion's den. The Lord lived among the wild beasts in the wilderness. Paul took no harm from the viper. Samson and David overcame lions. So a difficulty arises regarding dominion over animals. So interesting here, right? This paragraph here is showing, yeah, we have, we have dominion by reason. Now, a difficulty. Why were these wild beasts made that they should afflict humans? So... Now, after the fall, you have animals that afflict humans. And he answers, so that wicked sons might be chastised. So it's part of natural evil, part of God's discipline. After sin, a scourge was required. So he recognizes it comes after sin. Sin armed our own servants against us so that the uprising of animals was inflicted by God. As scripture testifies in Ezekiel 5, I will send famine and wild beasts against you. So just like we rebelled against God, our servants, he's saying by analogy, were, were brought to rise up against us. All of them appear gentle and tame to the just. Even now, when they have rebelled by divine mercy, very few perish from them. If anyone is destroyed by them, two lessons are given us. It is an example of the severity of God as with the Samaritans who were killed by lions, the children who were killed by bears when they mocked Elisha, and the disobedient prophet whom a lion killed. Further, it shows how great is the majesty of God that even wild animals revenge the injury done to him. And lastly, consider with me 
the goodness of God towards us, who has found these harmful beasts within deserts and solitary places, so they might wander or has bound them, wander only at night. Here also man may perceive his calamity after sin. It's interesting to think about what he's saying about animals, because now we think about it just evolutionary. So they wander at night because it's cooler and they're trying to survive. Whereas he's thinking of it primarily in terms of the providential rule of God and his discipline over us. So despite sin, wild beasts have not been able to shake off the human yoke completely. They fear and tremble at his sight. So this image is not properly meant in relation to the body since God is not corporeal. Yet it is not far from the likeness of God for it assists us by expressing many similitudes of God laying or lying hidden in the soul. Some Hebrews affirm that this was also spoken concerning the body. If you regard those images and likenesses of which God revealed himself in order to be seen by patriarchs and prophets, for he appeared as the son of man. If we accept the reasoning, we say that this was true rather than because of the incarnation of Christ. Such a body was given to man as God has already determined that his word would take upon him. As I've said, this is to be understood of the inward man, the soul of which the body is the instrument and therefore not completely alien to that likeness. Thus you have the true knowledge of man, a creature of God, form in the image of his maker. From this statement, we understand not only his rational nature, but his properties and his end, namely happiness, that according to such a constitution, we should live in those actions and express the image of God. Now he says this Aristotelian claim, our end is happiness, but earlier he said, happiness is right here, loving and knowing God, which Aristotle wouldn't say. All right, now the law, both natural and human law depends on this. So this image may be restored and preserved and man maintained, maintain free dominion. If we don't have the image of God, the natural and moral or human laws don't apply. All virtues proceed from the excellent state and condition of human nature to be just, valiant, and endowed with charity. From this condition of our nature, we may conclude that virtues are naturally engrafted in us, and the arguments by which Aristotle in his second book of ethics proved the contrary take place in this our corrupted nature. So virtues are natural to us. It's a little confusing what he's saying there. It seems to mean in that there are things humans can do, have courage, temperance, charity, and they're needed to get us to the knowledge of God. If you don't do those, you won't know and love God. Consider also the goodness of God that is, besides the excellent actions of virtue, human happiness requires abundance of outward things since they are instruments. For we do many things through riches or means. Therefore, at the beginning, God adorned the first man with great wealth and sovereignty. By this condition, man is admonished about his duty, the manner and form of all his actions. Whenever he is about to do anything, let him, let him say to himself, will this reveal my father? Is this to live according to the image? Let's put that down. Before we do anything... Let us ask, will this reveal my father? Is this according to his image? When you hear that God created you, you should remember the body, the whole artistry of all its organs and the utilities and ornaments of its several members, and as for the soul, all the powers, qualities, and actions which are found in it. Now, he, he goes in here, I miss, miss this part, but the re redemption of Christ is to restore us to that image of God that our first parents lost. And... It's interesting to help us think here about our body, because we might mo mostly think only about the soul as the image of God. But here he's saying there's something in, the, in us, in our body, of the, as an instrument and utility 
with its organs and several members that also reveals the image of God. So it was said before to the image and likeness, and this statement depicts one thing only, as I mentioned above, because two terms are used to say the same thing and refer to the greater expression. So image and likeness are not two separate things. It's the same thing, two words for the same thing. And concerning other living natures, we do not know how many were made separately. But as to humanity, two were created at first, and in such a way that the female was taken from the male. And from this, we have evidence of both choice and love. Since plants and herbs are given the power of producing seeds, they're able to propagate their kind. Even so in us, that function belongs to sexual differentiation. As I said, male and female, he created them. Adam was created first through preconception. When what happens later is recounted first, this may be referred to the first created man so that afterwards the woman was taken from him. Thus the capacity as it were is in him first. This explodes the Jewish fable, which Plato copied in the symposium. They hold that the first man was twofold, both male and female, and the woman was created through no less than a splitting and division of one from the other. So that's not true. Um, so how many plants were made first? Was there just two plants first or just two animals? It seems at least there weren't very many because it says be fruitful and multiply. So they hadn't yet multiplied. If you already filled the whole earth with them, they don't need to be multiplied. But specifically with man and woman, we know there was two. And that has that order there that we saw in 1 Corinthians 11 as well. God making man for this work, woman coming out of man to help him in that work. So Vermigli on the image of God, especially having to do with our rational nature to understand by which we have dominion, the goal of which is to know God.